So, in the first episode of this pet repair, I did all the cosmetic stuff, like cleaning the machine, trying to fix uh, the hole, which I actually did not yet. Just printed, 3D printed this little plug, which goes on the, the place where the switch was, the reset switch. And in this episode, I will try to fix the pad. And this is the pad that almost killed me. Physically and mentally. You will see in the video why. So I guess let's dive into this. The pad that killed me. Almost. Enjoy. So I actually did plug in the machine and my son was with me at the time and it was quite loud outside and I didn't hear anything. I tried to press play on tape and the tape began to spin. And then my son said, hey, the machine is buzzing. And I thought, hmm, but hmm, I can't hear anything. And I already had unplugged the machine. And so I plugged it in again, switched it on, and then I heard the buzzing sound. And I thought, whoa, okay. Buzzing is usually not a good sign on these machines. And it's especially not a good sign when it comes from the top housing where the monitor sits. So I thought, let's unplug the machine and let's take off the back of the machine and check what might cause the buzzing. And I will show you in a minute. And I was pretty shocked when I saw this. You can see this very well, but the high voltage coil is lying over there and it's not plugged into the tube. And that is what made this buzzing sound. And if it wasn't for um, the motherboard not touching the metal housing, I guess I would have gotten a pretty nice shock and maybe my heart would have stopped. And if this plug would have been turned around the other side, so touching the metal, well, that would have been some real fun. And I'm even more concerned because my son also touched the machine while it was plugged in because he wanted to try out if it, he could type on it and characters would appear. So whoever did this, uh, yeah, not a great idea. And I can also see that there's a connection over here which is not plugged in correctly. So someone clearly tried to tinker with this and didn't do a good job at all. So next order of business is to discharge this thing if it keeps the charge still and then to see how to get it operational again. Okay, I'm going steady cam here for a minute. Just to show you around a little, I did plug in this connector, this white one, and it's keyed, so I'm pretty sure that's correct. Everything else looks okay-ish, but there's this coil, I'm trying, oh, there it is, that pink coil back there that looks a little bit rusty or corroded i don't know and that's of course the elephant in the room which is the coil which is lying over here which should be plugged in over there so everything else looks okay i also noticed there's a screw missing up top all the other screws are there show you this 
but the one over there on top it's missing so i guess someone fiddled with this monitor and i will reattach the coil and try turning it on and hope nothing bad happens and i'm using double rubber gloves to protect myself while working in here because I really, really, really have respect for high voltages. Okay, so I did change the camera angle and put in some better lighting. And now I will try this again. in there. It's really hard to do without the proper lighting. Phew. And the light is always blocked when I put my hand there, of course. So. And yes, I know what you want to say. Wouldn't it be easier to just take this whole thing out of the case and do this properly? Yes, but I'm an idiot. I'm always trying to save a minute or two, so it's how it is. Okay, that could work. Let's see. Oh, much better. Got the first one in and the second and works first try. Success. Okay. So I guess it's time for that moment of truth. So let's plug it in see what happens. I really, 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 really hope this works. Would be an easy fix. Otherwise, that might be a much com more complicated fix. And I'm not sure if I have the skills to repair a CRT. Or it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be so um, wouldn't mind if the machine was broken. I'm pretty sure I can fix this, but I really don't know about the monitor. So I guess here goes nothing. Well, no buzzing sound, that's a good one. But also no picture. Which is not good. Oh, but there's the famous dot which Adrian Black tried to get rid of. So maybe this is just a matter of dimness or brightness. So let me turn this on again. And it does make a sound actually. Hey! Look at this. Commodore Basic bytes free. Not quite sure what bytes free means. Shouldn't there be a number? But ha! Huh. I'll be damned. So this was really all there was to it. 
and it's a black and white machine. I really thought it would be, a, it would be a green screen. And I'm not quite sure why there's no memory shown. Okay, so I guess uh, gloves come off. I already screwed in the back plate and this thing is good to go for now, but we still have to fix that memory issue. So that's coming up next. Okay, so for some diagnostic purposes, I decided to, well, why not type in a small basic program to check if there's really no memory like shown on the screen. And the machine is currently turned on and as you can see, there's no picture anymore. So I'm a little bit confused. And you can see the famous Adrian Black dot disappearing. And if I switch it back on, nothing happens. Okay, let's turn it off again. <clears throat> so there's our dot and turn it on again. Oh, there actually was a picture for a moment. So the machine seems to be working correctly. So maybe the contrast knob is a little bit damaged. So we do got a picture for a moment and then it disappears. So we might have had real luck that the machine actually turned on that one time I had it on camera. And I guess we have to diagnose a little further. Um, on a different note, I did print out a nice sheet which describes which is which on the on the board here and as you can see here's a ram here are the roms the green thing being the pia which is something like the cia on the on the c64 the cpu we have the video ram which might be faulty and not showing any uh, picture right now could be. We have the video ROM, which might be faulty. And we have a VIA chip, but there's a PIA2, so I guess this blue one is the second CIA like thing. And up here are all the voltage regulators to provide the board with the different voltages. So I have to dig into this a little further and and then we'll see what we can do. Okay, so I turned the machine back on and I guess I will be checking voltages now. <coughs> and that is five volts spot on, which is nice on the first one. I have a feeling that actually the voltages might be okay and that is it's just a matter of having a bad connection in one of the chips or something, but um, let's do this like professionals and check voltages first. And that is really some tight working area here. That is 4.96, which seems to be okay. And the third one. Which is 4.87, which is okay. And there's one last quite in the corner over there. Okay, so I did prop up the machine and try to open it a little bit more to reach down here. And I just hope that it doesn't collapse on me. Would be would not be too nice to get the full force of the high voltages from above. Try this again. Five oh two. So all the voltages seem to be in 
perfect condition which leads us to the next exercise which is to pull all the ICs clean the sockets put them all back in look at this just reseating the CPU in the socket did turn this machine or at least this monitor back on so let's power toggle uh, this one or power cycle as you say and turn it back on yeah reliably brings an image so it's a garbled screen which is a good starting point for further digging around and I have a feeling that what we are dealing with right here is just some bad socketed chips and I will re-socket I guess all of the chips and I can see that I guess this back there this one is a replacement socket it looks different than the other And I guess we'll go on with the ROM chips, which have different sockets again. Those really, really flat sockets I've never seen before. Interesting thing is there's no indication of where the notch goes, so you have to keep that in mind when putting, uh, pulling out the ICs. I really hope this does anything. Oh, look at that. See this? There's actually a lag missing and it's not stuck in the socket. The socket is completely clean. Look at that. Okay, so here we have a pretty good contender for our failure. And the next one, that one actually seems totally fine. And I have no replacement for these, so having a broken leg back in the days meant to shoot the horse but since this is not a horse I guess I can do one better and save this chip and give it a fresh leg and maybe this is all that is to this machine now <laughs> after all these things we have already fixed well obviously there was a problem with the CRT, there was a problem with the CPU not being quite right in its socket, not making good contact. And now we have a broken leg on one of the ROM chips. And this has some bent legs, but oh, this looks bent too. Are these sockets really wrecking my nerves here? Okay, so I re-socketed all the chips and I did indeed find one of the ROM chips missing a lag. And the lag is not stuck in the socket, so that must have happened some time before. And to fix that, we will have to get out a soldering iron and some replacement socket and we will simply 
solder this chip into a new socket and put this socket on the other socket. And I can then um, connect the lag from this chip to the socket directly and, and give him a fresh lag because I don't have a replacement for this ROM chip yet. And maybe I don't have to get one. Okay, so time to free the bench and pull out the soldering iron. Okay, the soldering iron is out. I have some fresh sockets. Hope this fits. And yes, it does. And the idea is to put the chip in the socket and attach this permanently so that I can wire up this broken leg down here to the other side. And actually, this does make contact already, but I'm still going to solder on this point here. So the upper broken leg is soldered to the socket from the lower leg. And we are just putting this in back there and see what goes. So the pad is back on the bench. Let's quickly put the ROM chip back in, which I hope will go fairly easy with this new socket. Oh, that's in there for good. Okay, let's close it up and let's see what happens as I plug in the power again and power it up. Hmm. Okay, we are still getting the garbled screen. But there's actually a guide online, a troubleshooting guide for the pet which, if I recall correctly, has some kind of image like this in a description what's, what may be the fault. So let me look into this and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so after looking into all of this um, troubleshooting guide, I actually managed to get some more information. There obviously are two different versions um, of memory in these boards. One is 6550 memory, which is DRAM, and the other one is 2114, which is also DRAM. And the machine needs just some of these sockets down here populated, depending on what kind of memory chip you're using. So for the 6550 version, you need to populate um, I1, I2, J1, J2. This is designed like a checkerboard, pretty much the same in the uh, like in the Apple II. You have the letters A to J from here to here, and you have one through nine, the numbers here, and so you can locate uh, things on the motherboard just by pointing to the coordinates, so to say. Um, you can also pull the PIA 1 and 2 chip. So let's refer to this. The PIA 1 being the green one and the PIA 2 being the blue one. So we could theoretically run the machine without this and this chip. But I think I'm going with a no RAM configuration for now because I have a guess that um, the RAM is faulty. And I can't even make out which type of RAM this is because it says, it says P7818, which is the production uh, date, so week 18 of 78. And it says TMS4045, which is none of the configurations. It's neither 6550 or 2114 DRAM. I guess this might be a replacement chip. It's a Texas Instrument chip and all the chips in here are Texas Instruments. They are all from the same production week and they're all the same chips. So these 
might actually be genuine, but I can't tell if this is the 6550 configuration or the 2114. So I guess we have to try that out. And in order to do so, we will first leave the first four in here, which is the configuration to test with 6550. And if that doesn't post, then we will go and remove all these and leave these four in here for the 2114 configuration. So this is what I'm going to do now. I'm pulling memory chips. So the machine should then start up and report 1K of RAM. And we can, if that happens, if we get the basic prompt and it says 1K of RAM, we can then go on and, oh, that wasn't good, and um, repopulate this chip by chip and see what we get. Okay, so these are the first to pull and I will switch on the machine and see what happens. And we get exactly the same as before. So let's switch this off again. And then we will go and try to populate the other sockets. So let's see what happens. And still just garbage on the screen. I guess next order of business would be to pull the um, the PR chips. And these would be the green and the blue. We just pull them out. I don't know what happens then, what, what could happen, best case or, or worst case. We'll just do that and see about it. And we will try again. Hmm. That looks pretty much like the same result but different characters. So I guess these PIA chips are pretty much the same like the CIA chips on the C64 as they drive the external ports, the keyboard and probably the tape deck. And so you, you would see a boot up screen and you pull these out just to make sure they don't short the system. We could still deal, still be dealing with a defective CPU. So I'm kind of on the fence here to switch that out. So while I was thinking about where to get a 6502 replacement CPU, I thought, hey, wait, isn't there a 6502 CPU inside a 1541? And as a matter of fact, I had a 1541, which was missing one of the, I guess, BIOS ROMs or something like that. So it's not non-functional right now. And I thought, why not pull that 6502 out of there and as it turns out this actually is a 6502b variant which i haven't seen before and i'm not quite sure if of if this is pin compatible with the 6502 can't find much about this chip so online so i guess um, it's time to just try it out Let's do this. See that the notch is actually turned to the case. Let's plug in this baby. And I guess let's turn the machine on and see what happens. Hey, that is, I would say, success. The cursor is missing, so I guess this is due to the two PIA chips that are still missing from the board. Let me quickly replace these and see what happens then. So I did put in all the 
Pia chips. I hope I did this in the right orientation. So let's, I guess, start it up and see what it does. And we get no cursor. That's not good, I guess. Keyboard doesn't work. Looks pretty much the same like before. Okay, so seems like we fixed one problem just to run into the next. Okay, so it turned out that I had this PIA chip, which is the PIA1, the wrong way around. The other one has the notch this way, and this one has the notch this way, which is why? Why, Commodore, why? Why do we do this? It makes no sense, and there's no notch or indication of which way around the chip has to go on the board. So I had to look it up on the internet and yeehaw, success. 716, seven bytes free. It seems like the replacement CPU did the trick. Um, the RAM chips seem to be okay. So it turns out 7167 bytes is exactly what you have to expect from a pad with 8K when booting it up. So, I guess we are finally ready to give this pet a try and check if the tape works and stuff like that. So, since we're here, let's first go with the classics and check if the keyboard works. I hadn't a chance to try this. Wow. So far, so good. Yay! Can you believe this? It actually works. Okay, so next up would be the tape. Which does seem to do something it's spinning i guess i did clean the head when i cleaned the mac uh, the mac the pad so doesn't look like anything is going on there so let me quickly rewind this uh, let me just grab a screwdriver and okay so there's the good tape which we can actually save something on. We should still have our very simple listing. And if we, what's that? Type safe PRG1. Oh no, that's not a one. And that's not backspace. That is. Press play and record on tape one. Now let's do this. Writing PRG1. Oh, that was fast. Okay, it wasn't quite a big program. So now let's try this again. Now we know there has to be a program on the tape, which is the Hello World program. We just wrote onto it. Okay, it has to go through the red tape and then at some point arrive at the good tape which should have the program on it. And that is not looking promising because it's still searching and I don't like that at all. So, we have a working pad, but we still don't have a working tape drive, I guess. Would be interesting to see if there's actually a program on the tape. So if reading is failing or writing is failing. So since the internal tape deck seems to be faulty, I brought out a C16 one with an adapter, which plugs right inside the machine over here which is 
the same connector as on the pet drive. And for now, we even have an eject button here, which is quite comfortable. And we will try loading a game again, or what we just put on here. So we can see if our writing of Hello World actually succeeded or not. I will prop up the camera a little, still searching. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know if this data set even works. But there's nothing here. So we will rewind this. And run stop does not work. I guess the machine actually froze. So, after the pet froze, whoa, what was that? There seems to be something not quite right with this pet. First I got a blank screen when rebooting it. And now it seems to be halting. Oh, I just pressed the key and it halted again. So I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Maybe the 6502B actually isn't compatible with the 6502. I have to order some genuine 6502s to put it in here and see what happens. But this does not look good. I actually I did heat sink all the chips just to make sure they don't overheat. But this does not look good. As you can see, the cursor is not flashing and the machine completely froze. But I guess this is it for part two of this obviously three-part series. We got the machine running. We actually managed to write the famous Hello World. And managed to, I guess, save a program to tape, which I'm not quite sure if we really did. We fixed the screen, um, we fixed the broken off lag from, oh, and there the machine unfreezes. That is totally crazy. I just pressed delete and the machine froze again. That is very, very strange. So this seems to be a CPU problem. And I'm pretty sure if I replace the CPU with a genuine 6502, this might actually w work reliably. And we'll see about this in part three. And we will see if I can get the tape to work. And if my uh, old um, tape to MP3 player thingy works in this machine. So stick around for uh, part three. This was part two. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye bye. So please like and subscribe if you are new to the channel. And until next time. Bye bye.